Welcome to the book reading program of 3ABN Australia Radio. Does your faith need a boost? Do you think that miracles only happened in Bible times? Think again. Compiled by Remnant Publications, the book Get Ready for a Miracle recounts true stories that prove that when we step out in faith, God displays His power in undeniable ways. Here is our reader, Harold Harker. This story is entitled, The Fiery Furnace. Psalm 107, 19 to 21 reads, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distresses. He sent His word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness, and for His wonderful works to the children of men. When I lived in Belize, it was still called British Honduras. We moved there in 1975 to help build a hospital in a little town called Cayo. After completing the hospital, we moved down to a smaller town called Benque Viejo, next to the Guatemalan border, where my dad purchased 125 acres of land on the outskirts of town. I was almost 13 at the time, so my dad asked me if I wanted to earn some money. Obviously I did. So he bought me a nice horse along with a single bottom plough, a harrow and a cart from the Hutterites that lived nearby. He agreed to pay me the same wage as any grown man was earning in town, working as a carpenter or a skilled tradesman, which was 25 cents an hour. Whoopee! I was making real money. Two bucks a day, Belizean. One US dollar. I took my horse and ploughed a few acres and planted everything, tomatoes, carrots, onions, cabbage and more. I even put in a banana, an orange plantation, consisting of about 30 trees of each. Every Tuesday and Thursday for three years, I took my produce into town with my horse and cart and sold it on the street corners. My horse, whose name was Lady, was the best horse a guy could have. She was so smart that when I had finished selling on one street corner, I would tell her to go and wait at the next one until I finished talking. And she would go down the street, around the corner, and wait at the right spot till I showed up. Another little game we used to play early in the morning when I would go out to the pasture to find her was that I would see her but pretend not to. Then I would start calling her name and looking around. She would find the nearest tree, even if it was only four inches around, and stand behind it, peeking out. As I moved around, she would shuffle around behind the tree until I would turn around and say, I found you. Then she would snort and come running. I noticed that there was only white bread in the village, so I asked an old man from Guatemala to show me how to build an adobe brick oven that was fired by wood. He showed me how, and I built it. Then I went up to the Mennonite colony and purchased bran from them as they brought it in from Canada to feed their chickens. I mixed 40% bran with 60% white flour and made a nice light brown bread. Now I had bread to sell in town with my produce. All the money that came from the sale of this stuff went toward a new primary school that Dad was building on the property. Things were going well, and the school was built. There were about 30 kids attending it, and Dad had found a young American girl from California with a teaching degree who was willing to come and teach at the school. Things were great. I was ploughing the fields with my horse, going to school, and baking 200 loaves of bread twice a week at four in the morning. In my spare time, I was wandering the jungle, collecting poisonous snakes for the British Army. They paid me a whopping $5 per snake, 
and I would find caves back in the jungle and explore them for hours on end. One Christmas, when I was almost 15, I started to like girls. I had my eye on a pretty Spanish girl in town. Late that Christmas night, I snuck out to town to go to the dance that was at the soccer field. I stayed out till four in the morning, dancing to Abba. Then I ran home to start the fire and bake the 200 loaves of bread. I had started the fire and mixed everything together by hand as there was no electricity in those days. Then I sat down to let it rise. Well, I fell asleep and when I woke at around 7am, the fire had almost gone out and the bread was running over the large mixing tub. I punched the bread back down and put more wood on the fire, but it wouldn't start. I grabbed a quart of kerosene and threw it in the oven. Then I tried to light the first match, but it broke. The second one wouldn't light either. And by the time I got the third match to light, the kerosene had run down, hit the coals and started to evaporate. Yes, you know what happened next. Everything blew up, including me. The blast was so big that it blew me back more than 30 feet. When I got up, I was fried from my waist up, had no hair, no fingernails. I was in really bad shape. I thought for a moment, then grabbed the water hose and sat down with it pouring over me. I called for my mum as my dad was away in Texas. She came running and screamed when she saw me. I think it was then that I knew I was severely burned. She yelled for my older brother who was visiting us for a while and he came and put me in the truck. They covered me with wet towels and took off for the new hospital we'd helped build in Cayo. I only remember about the first two miles of the trip and then the pain set in and I went unconscious for the next five days. When I awoke, I was bandaged from my head to my waist and my eyes were taped shut because they were badly burned too. The American doctor came in and said that I had severe third degree burns and would need to be flown back to the States for skin graft treatment as soon as possible. I had a friend back in Canada when I was five whose dad had been severely burned in a mill fire. I remember what he looked like after many skin grafts. It was awful and I didn't want any. I asked the doctor and he said there was no way that it would heal on its own. It was too severe. They fed me through a straw for another week and then uncovered my left eye so I could see a little bit. Then I asked my mum to come and get me. She did and took me back to her house where they put up a mosquito net on the porch because I stunk quite badly. I lay there for the next four months, refusing to go back to America for skin grafts. The next day, after I returned from the hospital, many people from the village came to see me. One of the old women who came said she would get a doctor from the jungle in Guatemala to come and heal me. I thanked her and tried to smile in appreciation. After a few days, an old man showed up and said he was asked by the villagers to come and help me get better. I asked where he was from and he said, I live far in the jungle, about three days walk away, and he pointed toward Guatemala. I realised that this must be the doctor that the old lady said she would send, or as I called him, the witch doctor. He brought lots of leaves, oils and ground up powders with him. He unwrapped all my bandages and cleaned off the white burn cream that the American doctor had given my mum to put on it. It really hurt. But I knew that the people of the village had asked him to come because they really cared about me. And, in turn, 
I wanted to show them the same respect. I did everything the witch doctor asked, even drinking stuff that I thought might be snake oil. Yuck! He crushed the leaves and applied them and the oils directly onto the burns. He said some were to help me with the pain and others were to help with the healing of the skin. He did this every day for a week. I got immediate relief from the pain and I can tell you firsthand there is nothing worse than the pain of being burned. After a week, a strange film that looked like saran wrap appeared, which I presumed it was a thin layer of skin. He left a whole bunch of his potions with me and said, you'll be okay if you keep doing this until it's all gone. After a month, there was clearly a thin film of skin starting to grow. It was very fragile. If I bumped it, it would tear and bleed. It was about a year before I could put my shirt on and off without tearing my skin. For the next three years, if I strained to pick up something or arm wrestled my brother, the pores on my upper body would seep little drops of blood. I am glad to say that if you saw me today, you would never know I had been burned. About 10 years later, I saw the American doctor who treated me. When he saw me, he said, I heard you never received skin graft. Take your shirt off. Let me see what's happened to you. I took it off and he stood there quietly examining me. And then he said, well, there is no medical explanation for this. All I can say is, if you believe in miracles, then this is what it must be. The publisher's comment, this is one example of where God sends help in many different ways. In this story, God has used natural remedies to heal even though they were suggested by a man who didn't know God. A reflection associated with this story comes from Ministry of Healing, page 226. The Lord's promise, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, Mark 16, 18, is just as trustworthy now as in the days of the apostles. It presents the privilege of God's children and our faith should lay hold of all that it embraces. Christ's servants are the channel of his working and through them he desires to exercise his healing power. It is our work to present the sick and suffering to God in the arms of our faith. We should teach them to believe in the great healer. You've been listening to the book reading program by 3ABN Australia Radio featuring Get Ready for a Miracle. For more information about this book, visit remnantpublications.com. Thank you.